Well, it is nine o'clock and it's time for the bedtime story. I have chosen to read the final section of a book-length poem, Autumn Journal, by Louis McNeese. And because this is rather short for this allotted bedtime, I shall preface it with a shorter poem by him, The Sunlight on the Garden, and another later piece, The Taxis, as a pudding course, or bon bouche. I'll begin, however, by filling in some background about McNeese and his work. McNeese is usually grouped with his contemporaries, Whiston Auden, Cecil Day-Lewis and Stephen Spender, as a left-wing poet of the 1930s. This is correct, they had all been contemporaries at Oxford in the late 1920s, and all, to differing degrees, were affected by the turn towards politics at the beginning of the 30s. But it is over-simple, McNeese never wanted to be in anyone else's club, and was actually acutely aware, aware of the futility of mere political gestures. As he wrote in the commitment number of the magazine New Verse in autumn 1938, the period covered in Autumn Journal, to describe his personal position. I have been asked to commit myself about poetry. I've committed myself already so much in poetry that this, this seems almost superfluous. I think that the poet is only an extension, or if you prefer it, a concentration of the ordinary man. The content of poetry comes out of life. Half the battle is the selection of material. The poet is both critic and entertainer. He should select subjects, therefore, which a. he is in a position to criticise and b. other people are likely to find interesting. The poet at the moment will tend to be a moralist rather than aesthete, but his morality must be honest. He must not merely retail other people's dogma. The world no doubt needs propaganda, but propaganda, unless you use the term as many do very, very loosely indeed, is not the poet's job. He is not the loudspeaker of society, but something much more like its still small voice. At his highest, he can be its conscience, its critical faculty, its grievous instinct. He will not serve his world by wearing blinkers. The world today consists of specialists, and intransigence. The poet, by contrast, should be synoptic and elastic in his sympathies. It is quite possible, therefore, that at some period his duty as a poet may conflict with his duty as a man. In that case he can stop writing, but he must not degrade his poetry even in the service of a good cause, for bad poetry won't serve it much anyway. It is still, however, possible to write honestly without feeling that the time for honesty is past. In 1936, McNeese and his first wife, Mary Ezra, were divorced. She was the stepdaughter of an Oxford professor and famous for her dancing. He was then living in a basement flat in Keats Grove, Hampstead, as the tenant of Geoffrey Grigson, the editor of New Verse. One benefit of these lodgings was the large garden that went with the flat. He was not bitter about Mary's leaving him for another man, and his poem about their marriage, the first one I'm going to read, connects his bittersweet mood with the mood of the world at that moment, with the war clouds beginning to gather and the sense of an ending. It seems appropriate to the present with its recognition of the need to live in the moment and be glad of it, as well as the pleasure of just sitting in the garden, if you are lucky enough to have one. The sunlight on the garden hardens and grows cold. We cannot cage the minute within its nets of gold. When all is told, we cannot beg for pardon. Our freedom as free lances advances towards its end. The earth compels upon it sonnets and birds descend. And soon, my friend, we shall have no time for dances. The sky was good for flying, defying the church bells and every evil iron siren and what it tells. The earth compels. We are dying, Egypt, dying, and not expecting pardon, hardened in heart anew, but glad to have sat under thunder and rain with you, and grateful too for sunlight on the garden. Autumn Journal, which I'm going to read next, mixes the personal and the political. The personal, 
with McNeese's own life as a university lecturer in Birmingham and his love affair with the painter Nancy Sharp, then married to another more famous painter, William Coldstream, and living in the next street in Hampstead. The Munich crisis in September 1938 and a dash back to Oxford in October to canvass in the by-election for the Labour candidate Patrick Gordon Walker, who was defeated by the Conservative Quinton Hogg, later Lord Hailsham, who supported appeasement. This is perhaps an experience many of us can relate to in terms of the recent past. Finally, a trip to Barcelona during the Spanish Civil War in the steps of other committed writers, when the Republic already looked doomed. At the end of the poem, MacNeese shifts the mood and a guarded optimism emerges. I like this for all sorts of reasons, and I hope, if you are meeting it for the first time, you will too. The reference to sleeping through the bad times in the hope of waking up and building a better world seems timely, and especially what that world will be like, which reads to me as a premonition of the reconstruction aims of the Atli government. Before reading the passage, just one footnote. McNeese came from Ulster and saw himself at times as an Irish poet rather than an English one. He refer refers to Tiernan Og, which, according to Wikipedia, quote, is depicted as an island paradise and supernatural realm of everlasting youth, beauty, health, abundance and joy. So, Autumn Journal, the final section. Sleep my body, sleep my ghost, sleep my parents and grandparents, and all those I have loved most. One man's coffin is another's cradle, sleep my past and all my sins, in distant snow or dried roses under the moon, for night's cocoon will open when day begins. Sleep, my fathers, in your graves, on upland bogland, under heather. What the wind scatters, the wind saves. A sapling springs in a new country. Time is a country, the present moment a spotlight roving round the scene. We need not chase the spotlight. The future is the bride of what has been. Sleep, my fancies and my wishes. Sleep a little and wake strong, the same but different, and take my blessing, a cradle song. And sleep, my various and conflicting selves I have so long endured, sleep in a sleepiest temple and wake cured. And you, with whom I shared an idyll five years long, sleep beyond the Atlantic and wake to a glitter of dew and to bird song. And you, whose eyes are blue, and whose ways are foam, sleep quiet and smiling, and do not hanker for perfection which can never come. And you, whose minutes patter to crowd the social hours, curl up easy in a placid corner, and let your thoughts close in like flowers. And you, who work for Christ, and you, as eager for a better life, humanist, atheist, and you, devoted to a cause, and you to a family sleep, and may your beliefs and zeal persist. Sleep quietly, Marx and Freud, the figureheads of our transition. Cagney, Lombard, Bing and Garbo, sleep in your world of celluloid. Sleep now also, monk and satyr, cease your wrangling for a night. Sleep my brain, and sleep my senses, sleep my hunger and my spite. Sleep recruits to the evil army, who, for so long misunderstood, took to the gun to kill your sorrow. Sleep and be damned, and wake up good. While we sleep, what shall we dream? Of Tiern and Og, or South Sea Islands, of a land where all the milk is cream and all the girls are willing? Or shall our dream be earnest of the real future when we wake? Design a home, a factory, a fortress, 
which, though with effort, we can really make? What is it we want really? For what end and how? If it is something feasible, obtainable, let us dream it now, and pray for a possible land, not of sleepwalkers, not of angry puppets, but where both heart and brain can understand the movements of our fellows, where life is a choice of instruments and none is debarred his natural music, where the waters of life are free of the ice blockade of hunger and thought is free as the sun. where the altars of sheer power and mere profit have fallen to disuse, where nobody sees the use of buying money and blood at the cost of blood and money, where the individual, no longer squandered in self-assertion, works with the rest, endowed with the split vision of a juggler and the quick lock of a taxi, where the people are more than a crowd, so sleep in hope of this, but only for a little, your hope must wake, well, the choice is yours to make, the mortgage not foreclosed, the offer open. Sleep serene, avoid the backward glance. Go forward, dreams, and do not halt. Behind you in the desert stands a token of doubt, a pillar of salt. Sleep the past and wake the future. And walk out promptly through the op open door. But you, my coward doubts, may go on sleeping. You need not wake again. Not any more the new year comes with bombs. It is too late to dose the dead with honourable intentions. If you have honour to spare, employ it on the living. The dead are dead as 1938. Sleep to the noise of running water, and tomorrow to be crossed however deep. This is no river of the dead or Lethe. Tonight we sleep on the banks of Rubicon. The die is cast. There will be time to audit the accounts later. There will be sunlight later. And the equation will come out at last. <coughs> McNeese worked in the BBC during and after the war. He died in 1963, shortly before his 56th birthday. It was mainly the drink that did for him. His poem, The Taxis, was written just two years before. Perhaps we can see this as a preemptive poem about uh, self-isolation. In the first taxi, he was alone, Trela. No extras on the clock. He tipped ninepence, but the cabbie, while he thanked him, looked askance, as though to suggest someone had bummed a ride. In the second taxi he was alone, tra-la, but the clock showed sixpence extra. He tipped according, and the cabbie from out his muffler said, Make sure you have left nothing behind tra-la between you. In the third taxi, he was alone, tra-la, but the tip-up seats were down and there was an extra charge of one and sixpence and an odd scent that reminded him of a trip to Cannes. As for the fourth taxi, he was alone, tra-la, when he hailed it, but the cabbie looked through him and said, can't Trilla well take so many people, not to speak of the dog? So, I think there's time for the last one. This may be is McNeese's best-known anthology piece. Uh, I'm very fond of it. So here goes, bagpipe music. It's no go the merry-go-round, it's no go the rickshaw. All we want is a limousine and a ticket for the peep show. Their knickers are made of crepe de chine, their shoes are made of python. Their halls are lined with tiger rugs and their walls with heads of bison. John MacDonald found a corpse, put it under the sofa, waited till it came to life and hit it with a poker, sold its eyes for souvenirs, sold its blood for whiskey, kept its bones for dumbbells to use when he was fifty. 
It's no go, the yogi man, it's no go, Glavatsky. All we want is a bank balance and a bit of skirt in a taxi. Annie MacDoodle went to milk, caught her foot in the heather, woke to hear a dance record playing of old Vienna. It's no go, your maiden heads, it's no go, your culture. All we want is a Dunlop tire and the devil mend the puncture. The lad of felt spent hogmanay, declaring he was sober, counted his feet to prove the fact and found he had one foot over. Mrs Carmichael had her fifth and looked at the job with repulsion, said to the midwife, take it away, I'm through with overproduction. It's no go, the gossip column, it's no go, the Cayley. All we want is a mother's help and a sugar stick for the baby. Willie Murray cut his thumb and couldn't count the damage, took the hide of an Ayrshire cow and used it for a bandage. His brother caught three hundred cran when the seas were lavish, threw the bleeders back in the sea and went upon the parish. It's no go the herring board, it's no go the Bible. All we want is a pack of fat, packet of fags when our hands are idle. It's no go the picture palace, it's no go the stadium, it's no go the country cot with a pot of pink geraniums. It's no go the government grants, it's no go the elections. Sit on your ass for fifty years and hang your hat on a pension. It's no go, my honey love, it's no go, my poppet. Work your hands from day to day, the winds will blow the profit. The glass is falling hour by hour, the glass will fall for ever. But if you break the bloody glass, you won't hold up the weather. Well, we're still a little short of time, but I think that's enough Louis McNeese poetry for one evening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.